study dementia care, a case study I, I, from a place in New Zealand that I can't pronounce. So please welcome to fly. Tereo is the language of indigenous Māori and English. Tereo is widely used in our education system, in our public sector and in our news media. Uh, so much so that many New Zealanders, particularly younger ones, are fractionally bilingual without even realising it. Language has been uh, bringing up Tereo after decades and decades of it being banned from being spoken in our schools and in most of our public spaces. Uh, Re-certifying re today and bringing it up into an elevated state has just been one way that our nation has tried to address the massive inequities of colonisation. Uh, and language has been an important part of the journey that we have been on uh, at Voice Up. I'm going to attempt the tricky thing. <laughs> I'm going to attempt the tricky thing. <laughs> I'm going to attempt <laughs> the tricky thing. development, the cognitive and social and emotional well-being of older people, including those living with dementia. Uh, we work with approximately 200 odd people every week in open and closed community settings. Uh, we like to say that we exercise the mind, the voice and the body, and the fact joy and laughter uh, was the medicine and a class of voice arts is the prescription. Uh, we are a Pākehā led organisation. Pākehā means white European and our practice is a white European practice. And uh, over the last 18 months as an organisation we have tried to discover ways that we can make our service and our spaces more recognisable to Māori kaumatua, Māori elders, and, uh, and more aligned with te ao Māori, te ao meaning the world view of Māori. And language was where we started. Um, we recently adopted in New Zealand a uh, Tereo term for dementia after a range of consultations with Kamata identified that the word dementia does not sit well with them. It's a Western word. It has a lot of fear and stigma attached to it. So, we now have, I'm going to use, a fucking name. Yes, beautiful. Uh, we now have this term, mate waiwari. Mate refers to being sick or aiming. Waiwari means to forget. And so now we talk about dementia, mate wadiwadi, or sometimes just mate wadiwadi. In that same consultation, um, Kalmata were asked, what is it that you need to feel agency and dignity in the support services that are now wrapped around you with a diagnosis of mate wadiwadi? And this is what one of the things, the key things that they asked for. Clicky thing. <laughs> which directly translates to social connection. They also asked for Fatumanua, which directly translates to spaces for the open and healthy expression of emotion. They also wanted spaces that practiced. Can we skip ahead on this one? My apologies. This tikanga. Uh, so tikanga is the processes and the protocols that work around uh, spaces and are culturally sensitive to Māori and the te ao view of the world. Uh, if you're doing whanami tanga, social connection, then you need kai, food. And if you are doing kai, you need kakia, which is prayer to acknowledge land and ancestors. So what we recognised as an organisation is that we were doing all of those things but we weren't calling it that. And so that is the first thing that we have done, is now, can you go back? Yeah, awesome. So now that's what we do, 
and not just the material that we use to raise awareness of our classes, which is free to everyone to attend, but also in, in, in the classes themselves. And we use the language without the translation. So we talk about, we're going to take a break for Kai, it's still a here, and we come back, we're going to do some Patamama. And even in spaces where we do not have Maori participants, or we just have Pākehā participants, the feedback on that change has been significant for us because people feel like it adds an element to the space that feels important for New Zealanders as we transition through this very murky time. Uh, every so often we get resistance because we work with older people and these changes are happening very, very fast and some people do not like them. But very rarely do we, as, as facilitators, need to deal with that because the group generally always call it out. The second thing that we try to do, so language is easy, right? We can do that really efficiently. Um, the other thing that we wanted to try and look at was how do we align the practice and that felt harder, but I had the beautiful gift of meeting an Akurangi, a teacher of indigenous Māori games, and discovered, of course, that play is universal. Uh, and he uh, taught us a couple of beautiful Māori games that we now use in our dementia spaces. And I just want to talk you through one very quickly. Uh, so this is a hand activity that's used to teach children the life cycle of planting from seed to harvesting. There's eight movements, and the first one, tahi, is the ground. The second one, rua, is the seed that goes into the ground. And toro is the first sprout that comes up. All together it looks like this. Tahi, rua, toru, fa, rimu, onu, fitu, weru. So eight movements, and we teach this game, we teach the purpose of it, we teach it in Te Reo. And when you use your hands like this, I don't know if you've ever heard, yeah, no, you know, brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand, it's really amazing for your brain. This game is like that on steroids. And for people particularly with dementia, sometimes the movement of hands becomes incredibly difficult. So if you can teach activities, uh, it's beautiful work for the brain. And then we ask people to do it with their eyes closed, and it doesn't matter what you've got, it's just about feeling it because we are an embodied practice. And then when you've got it, we ask you to speed it up, so you do it super fast, to the point where there's cognitive chaos, the brain has tried too hard, and now I can't do it. Uh, we create spaces in the work that we do for a lot of that. People who are living with dementia struggle with that experience all of the time, and they feel out in the world that there is judgment attached to that and try to create that same experience of working the brain, but when you get that cognitive chaos, you celebrate it. Uh, somebody, a lovely woman in one of our classes, young onset dementia, described it like catching a ball. If you throw me a ball and I catch it, I caught the ball, and I feel good because I caught the ball. But if you throw me a ball and it goes over and I have to lean my body and move my hand and I go like this and onto the floor and the ball drops just past my hand. I did not catch the ball, but look what I've done in my body. Look at the stretching, look at the energy that I have used. And if you can make the not getting the ball a celebration, which of course we all do, then there is beauty in that and, and a space for people to really work their brains in ways that they don't in other spaces because it's safe. We like to say at Voice Arts, if everybody does this right, it's very boring. So please don't. Uh, Okay, so uh, the third thing, uh, I think I've only got a couple of minutes to speak very quickly to this. The third thing that we did, and this just wasn't in consultation with Kamatua, this was across the board, where people were asking for a service that travels the length of the disease. We recognised that we were doing a lot of work with people with young onset in those first uh, mild dementia stages, but as they advanced with the disease and to advance mate wari wari. Uh, that the work that we were doing just wasn't aligned. The cognitive games and exercises they were no longer able to participate in, but what they could still do and love to do was to perform. And so we did a pilot project last year where we ditched all of the games and exercises and we simply went in as improvisers. And all we facilitated was scene work because we know how to make our scene partners look 
good, how to keep them safe, how to follow them on a journey, to go wherever they need to be in that moment. And that was an incredibly powerful project to be involved in because no matter where you are on this journey of life, or Matewariwari, the capacity to be playfully performative never goes away. And it was beautiful to see the agency uh, awarded to those people by coming in and working as improvisers. Final slide, I just want to talk very briefly on the fact that when we did that kind of project, we also um, wanted to get some data, 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 uh, and it's really hard unless you have a whole lot of money and a lot of time, which we didn't. But what we used was we used clinical observations, so we had clinicians come in and sit with us and observe the participants for five key things. Did they witness joy, the use of imagination, social connection, the use of physical body, overall engagement? We agreed that three was the average, three was a good day for people and anything over three was an extension brought on by their engagement in the program. And that piece of data, data for the first time, got our organisation health funding from Te Whatu Kua, which is our So now we sit very firmly in the crossroads, which we always knew we did, at the crossroads of art, psychoeducation and health, and it's a hellishly difficult place to be in, but an incredibly important place to be in. Funders do not want you to be at that crossroads, they want you to be one or the other, but we are holding firmly onto this place. Thank you.